Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Um, council colleagues and panelists, if you would please turn your videos on. We are here today, Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we have a very full docket of four ordinances and two quarterly oversight hearings. So we will jump right into it. I'm Eric Costello, Councilman from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee. I am joined in no specific order by my colleagues, uh, Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th District Member of the Committee, Councilman Ryan Dorsey, 3rd District Member of the Committee, Council Vice President Sharon Middleton, 6th District Member of the Committee, uh, Councilwoman Danny McRae, 2nd District uh, Member of the Committee, uh, and then it appears we are waiting on Councilman Isaac Gitsy Schleifer, 5th District Member of the Committee, and Oh, there he is. That was incredibly quick. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, and Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District Member of the Committee is on as well. Okay, excellent. All right, first item on the, oh, uh, we are joined, apologize, we are joined by Marguerite Curran, who is staff to the committee. Uh, in addition, uh, representing Mayor Brandon Scott is Natasha Mehu and Nina Themelis. Representing Council President Nick Mosby is Matt Stegman and Nikki Thompson. First item on the agenda for today. City Council Bill 21-0154, sale of property, 1201 North Rosedale Street. We have agency reports in from the law department, approved for form and legal sufficiency, who worked on this from law. Do you have anyone from law department on? Everyone hear me? All right, that's good. Is anyone talking? Maybe I can't hear. Where's uh, Nina or Natasha? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I do not see anybody from the law department on the hearing, but they would stand by the report um, in approving the bill for forming legal sufficiency, and I'll touch base with them now to get somebody on. Thank you very much. Uh, department of Planning, no objection? Correct. Who's that? Eric Tiso from Planning. Uh, we also noted in our report that um, uh, property is open space zone, uh, but it's my understanding that the intended user of the building is okay with the proposed use. It's not changing, so there's no zoning concern. Excellent. Thank you. Department of Housing and Community Development, no objection. Stephanie? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison for DHCD. We stand by our report. We do not object to the passage of this bill. Thank you. Department of Transportation, no objective, Liam, or no objection, Liam? Uh, Mr. Chair, Liam Davis, Baltimore City Department of Transportation. We stand by our bill report, which is no objection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Parking Authority of Baltimore City, no objection. Graham Brzezinski with the Baltimore City Parking Authority. We reviewed the red lip, uh, proposal and do not object. Thank you. Uh, Department of Finance, favorable. Uh, I think Mara or Bob. Good morning, Mara James for the Department of Finance. We stand by our report. Thank you. Uh, board of Est this has been referred to Board of Estimates. So it'll go to the board at a later date, uh, subsequent to this committee hearing. Uh, Department of Real Estate, favorable, Casey. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Casey Kelleher, uh, Comptroller's Office, Department of Real Estate. Uh, we stand by our bill and support it. I'm happy to give more details if necessary. Thank you, Casey. Uh, Nina, I understand that we have uh, Crystal from uh, Housing Authority of Baltimore City on with us. Yes, Mr. Chair, we do, um, and she is elevated to a panel. Thank you. Crystal, do you have anything to add? Thank 
There we go. Nothing to add. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll just go to either Casey or Crystal. Do you want to give a, a brief 30 second background of what the plans are for this property? Um, I would touch on the initial aspects and then hand over to Crystal um, or um, per perhaps uh, the developer. But the um, property for sale, 1201 North Rosedale Street, um, it is a property um, that's been vacant for a while. Um, it is a former PAL center. Um, and HABC, or their development arm, is the intended uh, purchaser. Um, so if approved um, for purchase, this will go through that uh, a disposition with HABC. Um, the property is adjacent to uh, Douglas Homes neighborhood. Um, and if it's um, acquired, I believe, and Crystal can give more details, HABC through their development arm, which is another acronym um, I can't think of right now, will work with their um, uh, partners in the community to renovate the property. Thank you, Crystal. Do you have anything else you want to share just in terms of future plans for the property once the transaction is completed? Yes, I am told that it's going to be used as a property management building office and also as a community space. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, colleagues, thanks. any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, Douglas Homes, you know, is in my district. Um, I thought they already hit a community space. Is this a new location? Are we are we certain this is adjacent to? And and be, before you address the councilman's question, is this is this directly adjacent to Douglas Homes? Okay. If I if I may, uh, Councilman, this is Liam from Transportation. I think I think it's actually next to Rosemont Duplin Community. Oh, thank you. That is correct, Liam. I'm sorry, I um, was reading off. Said Douglas Homes. I, like, okay. I apologize. No, <laughs> that right. is my lack Thanks. of sleep, not you, Councilman. Thanks, um, Liam. Colleagues, any questions? Seeing no questions, uh, Marguerite, do we have anyone for public testimony for this one? Uh, if you are a participant in the WebEx, if you would please use the raise hand function. I'm not seeing anyone, Marguerite, are you seeing anyone on the WebEx application? No, Mr. Chair, there's no one with a raised hand. Okay, who do we have on the phone lines? Uh, no phone lines. None. Excellent. Uh, colleagues, is there a motion to move the bill favorably? So moved. Second. Motion by Burnett, second by Middleton. Uh, Costello is a yes. Burnett? Yes. Dorsey? Yes. Yes. McCray? Yes. yes. Middleton? Yes. Uh, Schleifer? Yes. Yes. Stokes? Yes. Thank you. This bill passes 7 0 and moves to second reader at the next full meeting of the City Council. And we're going to take a two minute recess and then we'll be back. Okay, we're back in session. Colleagues and panelists, if you would please turn on your uh, cameras unless you're having uh, connectivity issues, please and thank you. Uh, Marguerite, on starting times, we, we don't have any issues, right? The three tax credit uh, reauthorizations were scheduled for, I think, 10 a.m. through 10.02 a.m., correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, we're gonna start with Council Bill 21-0167, High Performance Market Rate Rental Housing Tax Credit, uh, Citywide Application Extension. Uh, we have two other um, tax credit uh, application extensions or reauthorizations. Um, before we get to these, uh, do you want to acknowledge um, 
Mayor Scott and, and thank him for his leadership in, in putting together a uh, task force to review the efficacy of all of the tax credits in our portfolio, uh, which will include an upcoming review of all of our credits to determine which credits are working, which credits are not working, which credits need to be tweaked, uh, and opportunities to hyper incentivize economic development in areas of the city that have been economically depressed uh, without displacing existing residents and, and small businesses. Uh, that uh, task force is expected uh, to convene uh, sometime uh, before the end of the year to get started. Uh, the mayor has appointed uh, Shalanda Stokes and me to co-chair that. So we look forward to a robust discussion uh, with a wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, we're certainly going to be uh, heavily relying on expertise uh, and experience from our Department of Finance uh, as well as other city agencies such as Housing and Community Development, uh, the Department of Planning, uh, the Mayor's Office, Council President's Office, uh, the Comptroller's Office, uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, um, as well as uh, one of our local nonprofits, uh, Live Baltimore. Um, and I think having all of those folks in the room and the expertise uh, that they bring to the table, uh, as well as a variety of stakeholders um, involved in the industry, community leaders, et cetera. So very excited about uh, getting started uh, on that work. Uh, in the meantime, these three uh, tax credit reauthorizations are intended to be a stopgap measure until uh, that group has had an opportunity to fully review our entire portfolio uh, and make recommendations uh, to Mayor Scott and his administration uh, on how to proceed. Uh, specifically within the administration, I want to thank uh, the government relations team, uh, as well as uh, Chief of Staff Michael Huber uh, for their collaboration on this. Uh, the first one is the High Performance Market Rate Rental Housing Tax Credit Citywide Application Extension. Uh, this bill uh, would extend uh, the application deadline by a period of five years. Uh, there is a, a friendly amendment uh, to this bill, uh, which similarly uh, extends another date within the bill uh, I'll explain that in more detail when we get to the amendment portion uh, of this bill. Uh, let's start off with our agencies. Uh, we've got the law department uh, approved for form and legal sufficiency. Uh, Nina or anyone from law, uh, are we standing by that report? Mr. Chair, the law department would stand by its report and Vic Turvala is on as an attendee if he can be elevated. Marguerite, can you please make that happen? And in the meantime, uh, we will jump over to Department of Housing and Community Development. Stephanie, uh, no objection? Yes, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison with DHCD. Uh, we believe that high performance market rate rental housing tax credits incentivize the construction of new apartment buildings and the conversion of vacant commercial properties to apartment buildings and it may provide additional housing options for Baltimore City residents. So with that we stand by our report, no objection. Thank you. Uh, let's jump back to uh, Law Department. Vic? Uh, thank you Mr. Chair. We are as reported. We're standing by our report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Department of Planning, no objection to first to finance. I think yes. we still have Mr. Tizo. Uh, correct. Uh, we have no objection to further finance. It's more directly impacted. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, Justin Lane. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Justin Lane, Baltimore Development Corporation, BDC, stands by our report in support of this bill. Thank you. Uh, Live Baltimore. Uh, Annie Milley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Annie Milley, Executive Director of Live Baltimore, and we stand by information provided in our report. Thank you, Annie. We may come back to you um, when we get to the uh, Q&A session or section with uh, Council colleagues. And then the final agency is going to be Department of Finance, uh, Bob or Mara. Hi, good morning. This is Bob Senemi from the Department of Finance. Uh, we, we stand by our, our report. Um, I want to say that, you know, we think that the extensions are, are a good thing. They are a stopgap measure. Just want to stress how important it is that this work group that gets convened um, takes an honest and critical look at these credits. Um, some of these 
you know, we have done a lot of research on these. We actually had some help from a, an external consultant. We're, you know, very excited to, to share some of the findings in those reports because I think it will make the package um, all the much more beneficial for the city um, if we do these correctly. So we are in agreement with a, a stopgap measure, um, but just want to stress that we really think it's important for this group to, to get started right away and take a critical look at these and hopefully come back to the council um, at the end of the review with, uh, you know, with a series of suggestions or, or opportunities for improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, certainly the, the feeling is mutual and, and uh, want to let you know how much I appreciate the work that, that your team at BBMR has done over the years uh, on this issue, which is a pretty complex issue, uh, but you guys you. Have, have really been in the weeds and, and really taken a hard look at this over the years. So very excited about the task force coming up. Um, with that, we will jump to questions from our colleagues. Uh, and I'm gonna go just on the order that you appear uh, on my screen per usual. Start with Councilman Burnett. I don't have any questions, Mr. Chair. No questions. Councilman Stokes? No questions. Thank you. Councilman Dorsey? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Bob? You said you hire, you work with a consultant to produce some uh, some information, and you're looking forward to sharing that. Are you saying you're looking forward to sharing that with this work group, or is that something that you have available that can be shared right now? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not available to be shared yet. We're finalizing it. Um, the idea was that we would share some of the findings with uh, share the findings with the work group in an effort to, um, you know, improve the overall structure of our, our tax incentive. So it's not quite complete, but uh, yes, we had done some work um, about a year and a half or so ago with with Ernst and Young to help us look at all these credits. We're we're finalizing a report, and it's intended to be shared. Uh, first with the work group, um, so we can try to improve the, the overall structure. Councilman Dorsey, uh, Councilman Dorsey, just one uh, point of clarification I wanted to add. Um, while I'm not sure um, if the work group is, is subject uh, to, to the Open Meetings Act, we made a, a determination early on that, that we're gonna comply with that out of an abundance of caution. So those discussions will be open to the public um, we're still working through details, like in terms of streaming those meetings. Obviously, they're going to be virtual to this to start, and then we'll you know follow the pandemic and, and appropriate health guidance on those. But just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Please back to you, Councilman. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of this work group today. I would like to have those documents as soon as they're shared with the work group. I'd like to review that at the earliest opportunity myself. Um, in terms of this being a stopgap measure, we're talking about a 15-year extension. Am I correct on that? No, we're talking about a five-year extension. Five year. Got you. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, okay, five years, you know, whatever, it seems like a stopgap, I guess, given the, the nature of this credit and how it uh, is applied for and uh, affected. I remain very concerned about this um, this credit, particularly considering essentially the unequivocal language of the finance department's report on it last term that it's um, inequitable and that it benefits um, property owners, developers, and doesn't really seem to have any but for effect on development. Um, so I'm certainly really looking forward to seeing any other assessment of it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Middleton? No questions, but um, I concur with Councilman Dorsey on um, making sure that his ass come to the total committee. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We'll make sure that happens. Councilman Schleifer? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman McCray. No questions. Thank you. Um, Marguerite, uh, we do, who do we have for uh, public testimony? And uh, First, folks who are using the WebEx, David. if you could use, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead, Mr. Chair. No, no, 
to you. you're in charge. I was hoping that you told them to raise their hand if they wanted to testify. So yes, I if, they, if they could raise their hand and, and you, you call them off, Marguerite. Thank you. Uh-huh. David Bramble. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Am I testifying? What's happening? <laughs> uh, Mr. Bramble, you are you're signed up to testify, or you are testifying now. Okay. So, all right, thank you um, everyone uh, uh, for having us today. Um, I think this is a really important issue. Um, I wanna say that uh, I'm very encouraged by the fact that uh, uh, the uh, council and the mayor's office and all the other participants have decided to get engaged in this task force um, to try to figure out what the path forward is um, Obviously, development is critical um, to Baltimore City, um, across the city, not just um, you know along the water, but in lots of different markets in the city where where we need um, help getting these projects done um, to make the math work. And I think taking a really strong and critical look at these credits is 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 exciting, and it's the right path for us to take. And in the interim. Um, Passing this uh, stopgap measure, as you as you guys have outlined, it is also critical because uh, we don't want in development the thing that investors hate most is uncertainty. So having this uh, time period uh, where uh, people have a sense, uh, investors and developers have a sense of of um, number one that the city is developing a comprehensive plan um, in the background, but in the interim, you know, projects that are underway or that are close to being underway don't get disrupted until the comprehensive plan is put together. So I wanted to just make sure that my voice is heard on that and that, uh, you know, that the, the, the developers and other participants in the city are, are, are very happy to hear about the, the plan, the long-term planning, as well as the, uh, as well as keeping everything, uh, status quo in the short term. Um, so as not to disrupt projects that are uh, either underway or close to being underway. So thank you all for your leadership on this. Um, and obviously I can answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bramble. Uh, colleagues, any questions? Uh, Next is Jason Williams. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for uh, allowing David and I uh, to speak, um, you know, I think David said it very eloquently. We're here in support of this legislation. Uh, if there's any questions for us, you know, we are continuing to invest not only in uh, the revitalization of downtown, but also in our neighborhoods. Uh, and these tax credits will allow us to invest in bringing density to downtown, uh, to the neighborhoods, and revitalizing some of these properties that have been um, focused on by the city for a long time. So. I'm excited to see um, the leadership of the council uh, and the mayor's office pushing this ahead uh, and that the team is really coming together. And I could not think of two better people, Councilman, Ms. Chairman, and Ms. Stokes to uh, to help lead the way on that task force. So thank you and I'm here for any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Williams. Marguerite? John Laria, last name L-A-R-I-A. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, well, thanks. Uh, I'm John Laria. I'm here today on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association, of which I'm the Baltimore City Chapter Chair. Uh, MBIA uh, has uh, thousands of professionals across the state and hundreds in the city who are engaged in the building industry, so this is a matter of great interest to us. Uh, we strongly support this bill. Uh, I have served on several mayoral task forces on property tax reform over the years, and it's clear that the city's property tax rate is a material impediment to investment and to development. As you know, the city's property tax rate is the highest in the state. It's more than twice the surrounding jurisdictions. And while there are many reasons that the tax rate is, uh, is high, some of which are quite justifiable, uh, nonetheless, it is really an impediment in trying to get uh, projects going because of the burden it imposes. So, like Mr. Bramble, we, we commend the mayor and other leaders for announcing the tax credit 
task force, which I hope will look at all the ways we can incentivize all types of development across the entire city in all neighborhoods. Um, I think we have some ideas about ways to incentivize in neighborhoods and uh, that are not being attended to these days, but we also think that uh, the existing credits are critically important and we look forward to participating in any way that we can with finance and others to take a critical look and make sure that the city's uh, resources are being used efficiently and effectively. So we, like others, view this as a practical interim solution um, to let the task force do its work. We certainly pledge our full cooperation and any expertise or resources we can bring to the table uh, to help the analysis and to help you reach conclusions. And uh, we look forward to working with you. So we appreciate your leadership uh, and, again, are fully in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, the council president, uh, Nick Mosby, his, his role in, in working together with the administration, uh, the formulation of this, the establishment of this task force, um, his support of these credits uh, has certainly been instrumental in this process. So, Mr. President, uh, if you're listening, thank you uh, for your leadership on this. Marguerite, back to you. Ron Potter. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for your time, and I, I don't want to be repetitive. Um, my name is Ryan Potter. I'm an attorney at a firm called Gallagher, uh, but I'm also on the steering committee along with many others of a group called the Baltimore Development Work Group, which is uh, an affinity group of professionals focused on real estate development issues in Baltimore. And like those before me, I would just like to echo their support for this as a stopgap measure. Um, congratulate and, and uh, appreciate the effort to form the task force. And as Mr. Seneme said, really look forward to um, an open and honest assessment of all of these credits and to do what's best for Baltimore. So uh, thank you again, and we support this effort. Caroline Hecker. Good morning, Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg. Um, I'm also a member of the steering committee of the Baltimore Development Work Group. I, I don't need to pile on any any further here. I think Mr. Potter, Mr. Laria covered the the development community's um, support of this this bill, and uh, we encourage the uh, committee to to vote in favor of it. Mr. Chair, there are no other hands raised. Maybe Andy Milley, who's our panelist. Andy, are you good? Uh, I'm, I'm good unless anyone has any questions for me. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Marguerite, do we have anyone on the line? On the, on the phones, I mean, sorry. No call in, sir. None. All right, thank you. Colleagues, any other discussion or questions? Okay, there was an amendment uh, for this bill that was, it's actually three amendments, um, but it's really one in nature, um, which were, which was circulated at 9.48 a.m. Uh, this morning government relations teams for the mayor and the council president, uh, as well as Marguerite, were copied on it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this bill seeks to extend the application deadline uh, for this credit uh, by a period of five, year, five years. Uh, also in the city code uh, for this tax credit uh, is another deadline, which is the deadline by which a use and occupancy uh, needs to be uh, in hand in order for the credit to go through, in order for you to essentially complete uh, the acquisition of the credit, uh, if you will. Um, so that period also needs to be extended. So that's what this uh, series of three amendments does. Um, is there a motion to move these three amendments? Motion to move all three Second. amendments. Second. Motion by Middleton and a second by Stokes. Uh, Costello is a yes. Middleton? Yes. 
Bill Tinsley. Yes, Stokes. Yes. McCray. Yes. Burnett. Yes. Schleifer. Yes. Dorsey. Yes. This amendment passes 7-0. Is there a motion to move the bill favorably as amended? Motion to move bill favorable as amended. Motion by Middleton. Is there a second? Second. Second, uh, second by Schleifer. Uh, Costello is a yes. Burnett? Yes. yes. Stokes? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. McCray? Yes. Dorsey? Mr. Chair, given the uh, Finance Department's report last term, as I refer referenced in my comments earlier, uh, I still remain just very skeptical about the uh, the equity of this tax credit and, and the, the necessity of its application. I have to vote no, no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Middleton? Yes. Uh, this bill passes six to one and moves to second reader at the next full meeting of the City Council. Next up, City Council Bill 21-0168, tax credits, historic properties, application extension. Uh, let's start off with our city agencies. Uh, we will go to, we'll go to law department first, for, approved for form and legal sufficiency. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Vic Turbola, Law Department. Yes, we approve it for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you, Vic. Uh, Baltimore Development Corporation, favorable. Justin Lane? Um, it's actually uh, Ms. Howard for this one, uh, Kate Howard. Yeah, uh, good morning, Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, BDC stands by our report. Thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. Department of Housing and Community Development, no objection? Yes, thanks again, Mr. Chair. Stephanie Murdoch from DHCD. We stand by our bill report. We have no objection to the passage of this bill. Thank you. Uh, Live Baltimore provided comments but not taking a formal position on the bill. Annie Milley? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Annie Milley, Executive Director of Live Baltimore, and we stand by information provided in our report. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Department of Finance, favorable? Hi, this is Bob Senemi, uh, Budget Director representing the Department of Finance, and, and we stand by our report. Um, you know, same comments we made earlier, uh, support these as a stopgap measure and, and emphasizing the importance of a, a good, strong work group to, to look at these collectively. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Department of Planning, favorable? Uh, yes, sir. Eric Tisa for planning, recommend favorable for this bill. And I also note my colleague Eric Holcomb is also here, our Executive Director for CHAP, who can give you more detail. Thank you, uh, Eric. So we did law, did planning, we did BDC, we did DHCD, we did Live Baltimore Fund. Okay, uh, CHAP, Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, uh, Eric Holcomb. Yes, uh, uh, we approve this. Uh, uh, we recommend, a, uh, recommend approval for this bill and we uh, thank you for all your uh, efforts. And we look forward with working with the tax credit group to uh, if need be, tweak this to make it uh, uh, more e equitable and help uh, re revitalize our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, colleagues, any questions for city agencies? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Just for um, Eric Holcomb, if he could just explain a little bit more why historical preservation is you know a part of this and how you know the equality with the previous bill um sure um i i would be happy to address that that's 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 a long conversation and and we could just speak to that um it, it's tied to uh, historic preservation because we believe that the actual uh, restoration rehabilitation of the current uh, building buildings in this uh, in the city the historic buildings in the city is a way to help maintain and even enhance the property values uh, in all uh, uh, in all neighborhoods uh, right now, this is eligible for the National Register, which there's many of those neighborhoods. And what we have discovered 
in terms of equity is that this local preservation tax credit is absolutely essential for the rehabilitation efforts and work that is occurring in our most distressed communities in East Baltimore and Harlem Park and Old West Baltimore. And we see that this, this credit is absolutely essential to make those projects work. And that is something that really helps. Also, the second thing it helps is it gives uh, first time home buyers the ability to actually help purchase homes meaning that when you rehab a structure, a vacant or abandoned structure in, in a community, um, you actually pass on to the owner a savings of maybe two or three hundred dollars a month in the monthly debt service and that has allowed for folks to become first-time home buyers in these communities. We're very proud of that and uh, we again we look forward to really speaking to this and analyzing how this credit can be used and maybe even revised to be used better to to help our more distressed communities. Does that answer your questions? Yes, it does, Eric. Thank you. I wanted that for a matter of record and uh, you mentioning some of the communities as well as a number of people, I guess, do not know that that Park Circle area of Park Heights is also in a historic preservation area as that whole area is going through re revitalization and we have several communities throughout our city like that and uh, all of this is important especially now that we're trying to um, move out of COVID. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, any other questions colleagues? Councilman. Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, Eric, um, the just I guess in furtherance of the question that the vice president just asked, is there a clear race equity impact uh, study that CHAP or the planning department has done on you know, who benefits from this credit? Not just, not just in terms of its uh, ability to help spur or uh, move forward development in uh, you know, disadvantaged communities, uh, low-income communities, uh, predominantly black neighborhoods, and revitalize those neighborhoods in terms of making you know keep preserving buildings or spurring construction but like literally the economic benefit directly to low-income individuals households black households black individuals uh people of color in general do we have any study on that impact and i ask that because it's like pretty easy to find a lot of opinion and perspective that says that um, preservation tax credits basically uphold uh, white supremacy. Um, uh, th thank you for that question. And I think that um, as, as, as we look at historic preservation and as it, has, it has evolved through the 50, 60 years since the 1966 Historic Preservation Act, we see that um, it, it has uh, extremely helped uh, African-American communities and I could go find some uh, uh, reports for you that were that have been done by uh, uh, several organizations. The National Trust for Historic Preservation has been interested in, in what you're uh, uh, suggesting, the, the hypothesis that preservation uh, upholds white supremacy and I think a lot of their uh, findings uh, uh, dispute that that notion and I'll uh, look forward to that and I can get that to you and I could also get it to Councilman Costello for this committee if they would like. Um, I think there's a couple of things to really look at. First of all, you know, historic preservation is about uh, celebrating history and what we have done at least in CHAP uh, for uh, many years and really uh, uh, have worked on in the last few years uh, the, the celebration of the African-American community in Baltimore. 
And those are sort of those stories that we tie to the geographical areas, we tie to uh, the, the African American community and, and celebrate that. And it helps define and characterize communities as, as helps define and characterize Baltimore City as a whole in terms of its culture and its heritage. And that's something I think is uh, 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 very tangible in its value. It may not be a dollar for dollar value or a, quanti or a value that you can quantify, but it is out there. And we will find those uh, uh, research reports. I could also send to you the tax credit study that we did a couple of years ago with Place Economics. And that study will show uh, how this, the CHAP credit, has helped uh, African American communities throughout this city. So I mean, we. It, it, this, yeah, this look, a, I, I look forward to getting that, um, and I just want to, again, just put a fine point on it. There's, it's often that we hear about benefits to Black communities, but that is often, in, in my opinion, and I don't think many others. A conflation of the idea of development occurring or building happening in black communities and that's not necessarily to the benefit of black people in those communities um, and they're not necessarily the individuals and households that are directly benefiting from the credit um, or any yeah, I, 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 yeah, we, you know, we could talk further about that. Um, I would suggest that you look up a, a uh, Columbia University professor named uh, uh, Dr. Hal Freeman, and he's done a lot of work on what uh, historic preservation and redevelopment has done uh, to uh, African American communities throughout the country. So that is something that we can we can look at, uh, um, and I'd be happy to try to get that information to you. There are, I think, in Baltimore, as we begin with this tax credit committee, I look forward to uh, really uh, furthering this discussion and really coming up with recommendations to make uh, Baltimore the leader in historic preservation and equity and actually helping the current residents in many of our distressed communities. All right, great. Yeah, if you could send me a link to any, I see the link here to Shaft study. If you could send me the information to the Columbia University professor, um, and since that that ch link was put in the chat, I'll just add this other one in here because it's from a University of Maryland professor, uh, an article titled "10 Ways Historic Preservation Policy Supports White Supremacy and 10 Ideas to End It." And so uh, I think that that's probably worth looking at for anybody who hasn't seen it. Uh, thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. Any other questions? Marguerite, do we have anyone with their hand raised to testify on this one? No, Mr. Chair, none. Thank you. Um, there are no proposed amendments for this bill. Uh, colleagues, is there a motion to move the bill favorably? So moved. Motion by Middleton. Was that a second by Stokes? Yes. Second by Stokes. Uh, Costello is a yes. Middleton? Yes. McCray? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Dorsey? Yes. Burnett? Yes. This bill passes 7 0 and moves to second reader at the next full meeting of the City Council. Uh, we will now hear Council Bill 21 0169, High Performance Newly Constructed Dwellings Tax Credit Application uh, Extension. Uh, Let's start with our city agencies, law department, proof for form and legal sufficiency. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Yes, correct. Uh, we approve it for form and legal sufficiency. 
Thank you. Department of Planning, no objection? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, TSA for Planning, no objection, defer to finance. Thank you. Baltimore Development Corporation, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Baltimore Development Corporation stands by its report to support the bill. Thank you. Department of Housing and Community Development, no objection, Ms. Murdoch. Yes, thanks again, Mr. Chair. The Department of Housing and Community Development stands by our bill report. We believe that newly constructed tax credits incentivize the construction of new homes and the substantial rehabilitation of vacant homes and may provide additional housing options for Baltimore City residents. So we stand by our report. We have no objection. Thank you. Uh, Annie Milley, Live Baltimore, uh, you have comments but are not taking a formal position on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Annie Milley, Executive Director of Live Baltimore. We stand by information provided in our report and also information provided in previous reports related to this credit. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Department of Finance, uh, favorable? Yes, uh, Bob Sanami representing the Department of Finance. Uh, uh, we report favorable for this bill. Uh, and, and you know, again, echoing the same comments as before, we agree with this as a stopgap measure in lieu of you know a broader, more holistic review. Thank you. Thank you. Um, colleagues, any questions? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess this question is for you, Mr. Chair, just for clarification. This is very similar to the other tax credit that we heard two bills ago, and correct? Um, how so? This is the high performance, newly constructed tax credit, correct? Yeah, so uh, high performance is a um, umbrella of state enabling legislation, um, which in short requires that buildings, uh, that structures um, be built with um, a green sense, if you will, right? Like high performance in terms of energy consumption. Uh, so the high performance um, market rate rental credit is for apartment buildings. Um, this one is for uh, either newly constructed dwellings, like single family dwellings, like a row home, or substantial uh, rehabilitation of a vacant uh, row home. This is the bill that, this is the um, credit that we created a couple of years ago that was done when the state had not passed the enabling legislation to further the existing credit for it was it high performance or was it newly constructed it, it was just newly constructed so um in 2019 i introduced a this bill which is essentially the same as the former credit it just adds a high performance component to it in terms of energy consumption, which I don't know that there's anyone on this call that would disagree we shouldn't be doing already. Um, so it's it's essentially the, the same um, structure of the credit, if you will. And have we reinstated that other original credit or is this the only one, is it possible to get both? Uh, they're, they're the same credit this credit is stricter in terms of the, the green standards that are imposed on the builder. But it, so it's, it, yeah, let me explain it a different way, if, if I may, Councilman. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not doing a great job of explaining it. For some period of time, I think this dates back to maybe 2004, 2005, there has been a newly constructed dwelling tax credit. That credit can be utilized for new row home construction, uh, whether it's one row home or an infill development of 280 row homes, or it can be used for the substantial rehabilitation of uh, an existing vacant row home. What changed in 2019 is we added it under the high performance umbrella, meaning that certain standards need to be met that didn't need to be met before 2019. Uh, there are three different pieces, and I'm not recalling off the top of my head, uh, that uh, are, are different sets of standards like lead silver and other things like that. Most of those things are baked into our building code, as, as you're aware, Council. We have a, a 
a fairly progressive building code in terms of how we look at the need to build things with, with green components and environmentally friendly components. So the only thing that changed in 2019, as we said, in order to be eligible for this same credit that we've had, you need to do a little extra more on the green side of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you can no longer get the newly constructed tax credit. That is no longer available without meeting the high performance aspect. Yeah, exactly right. The same credit, but you have to do a little more on the green side. All right, just making sure we're, we're talking about, we don't have both credits, we have one credit. Correct, the, the, the previous iteration of the credit uh, no longer exists because the state enabling legislation uh, has has expired. And so, okay, and so just to be clear, in the previous hearing, when I mentioned the finance department's report, um, it was actually the report on this in 2019, the, when they were talking about the history and equity and um, benefits of the newly constructed dwelling tax credit. Well, this, this credit uh, was, this specific credit with the high performance flavor to it, if you will, was established in 2019. Again, same credit, just adding the green requirements. This credit was um, reauthorized uh, last year, or not last year, um, was authorized earlier this year in February uh, to be extended a year. So they, uh, presumably finance submitted an agency comments report in or around um, the summer of 2019, as well as the spring of 2021. Is, is somebody here able to speak to the extent to which the high performance requirement goes beyond what would be required anyway by our building code? Probably the, the best person to speak to that is not on the call. Um, and she has been detailed elsewhere, but that would probably be Katie Byrne um, from DHCD, who, as you know, is no longer in, well, she's wearing multiple hats, but is now uh, you know, much more focused on, on uh, BMCA. Yes, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Ms. Byrne was unable to join us today, but Councilman, if you would like to follow up with us after the hearing to learn more about the specific uh, qualifiers for the eva uh, evaluation of these credits, uh, please reach out. And Councilman, I can work on, on digging something up. I know that, I, I believe that John Laria is still on the call. Um, and I know that John was involved in some of those discussions uh, back in, in uh, 2019, as well as in the spring of this year. So he may have a little more information as well, but I'll, I'll look in the meantime. Okay, great, thank you. Colleagues, any other uh, questions? Okay, uh, Marguerite, let's get into uh, public testimony, please. Mr. Chair, there's one person who had their hand raised. Oh, he may have gone now because um, Rob uh, Brennan, are you still here? He had his hand raised. No, he's not here. So let me go to David, uh, David Bramble. David Bramble. Hi, yes, mm -hmm. uh, David Bramble. This is, uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks again for having me. I've been, just wanted to, again, support, uh, support um, the efforts here to extend this as a stopgap until we've, had the opportunity to really analyze it and come up with the the best go forward uh, way to uh, to make sure that these um, all these credits are are uh, make sense from the city's perspective and from all the different residents and communities that are impacted by development. Thank you. Okay. 
next will be Jason Williams. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for uh, allowing us to, to once again testify in favor of this tax credit. Um, as many of you know, we, we're not just a development company, but we're also a construction company, and we're excited to be the first minority owned co company in Maryland to be passive certified for high efficiency homes. Uh, we will be doing two of these projects in partnership with other developers, one on North Avenue, uh, which is adaptive to use passive house um, uh, project, and then soon to be announced one in South Baltimore with South Baltimore Community Land Trust in partnership with a local developer as well. So. Um, want to testify in support. Uh, these tax credits are very useful in ensuring these projects success, but also in our ability to, uh, you know, take it to the next step, which passive housing is the next step in, in, in construction of homes here in Baltimore. And uh, Marguerite, before we continue, I want to go back to um, uh, if Mr. Br is Mr. Bramble still on the line? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm here. Because I do have a a proposed amendment that would extend um, the application deadline from from two years to five years. I wanted to get Mr. Bramble's uh, specific perspective on this because I know he's doing uh, a project in West Baltimore, um, and just want to hear his experience in terms of you know why a longer period of time, even as a stopgap measure, is is critically important depending on the scale of the work that one is doing. So, Mr. Bramble, can you comment on that, please? Sure, and thank you for bringing this up. Um, it's a, having the time is critical. Um, as you know, the development process in Baltimore City, and not just Baltimore City, but throughout the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast uh, is a slow process. It takes a lot of time. And particularly when you're doing business in disadvantaged communities, um, which as you know, we do projects in, in lots of different neighborhoods in Baltimore. Um, and we have one very large project in in West Baltimore um, that will involve ultimately the sale of uh, or the construction of new town of new homes um, and uh, making sure that we don't change things abruptly particularly when you have projects that have a very long development and entitlement cycle um, is critical to obtaining the financing um, and to making sure uh, that these projects are, are successful um, it, it just, uh, you know, as you know, it just takes a really, really long time to get them done. Um, now, of course, my hope uh, is that long term, the, uh, the the task force that you guys are putting together comes up with something so that we don't need to keep doing this um, and that we come up with, you know, a strategy that makes sense overall. But in the interim, you know, not providing a long enough time frame is, is essentially, uh, you know, is essentially putting the nail in the coffin of multiple projects um, that are that are you know either underway or or in the design development and entitlement stage that won't be ready uh, within a short time frame. So uh, I appreciate you bringing that up, and and I think that's it's critical that we make sure there's enough time to keep these things going. Thank you, Mr. Bramble. Appreciate it. Back to you, Marguerite. John Laria, Laria, L-A-R-I-A. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. yes, ma Thanks again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, well, let me just uh, uh, a couple of quick points. So again, it's not to be redundant. We also support the extension to five years for the same reason that Mr. Bramble just mentioned. Um, hopefully. Um, the uh, task force, uh, presumably, the task force is not going to take five years to make a suite of recommendations. But the problem is at the front end now, if you have too short a window, it affects people's ability to count on something like that uh, being real for that project. So uh, just as we, the the, uh, the the first credit that was discussed today, the market rate um, um, high performance rental um, is at five years. We think this ought to be five years as well, with the uh, hope and the expectation that it's not going to take anything near five years. But the problem is that someone who's looking at a project here, for example, is not going to understand or appreciate that this the task force working on these things and so on. So we need to have we need to have a little bit of, of cushion there. And I think the five years makes sense. 
Um, second, I just want to um, very briefly, uh, Councilman Dorsey, you, you asked a few questions. Um, the um, uh, Councilman Costello is, of course, quite correct that the high performance newly constructed dwellings credit uh, was, was frankly, I think, uh, his effort at the time, as I recall, to rescue that credit when uh, the state authority for the pre-existing newly constructed dwelling credit, which did not have a high performance component, uh, when the state authority disappeared, the city was kind of encumbered. And uh, I think some research was done and Councilman Costello and others concluded that you could use the state's authority for high performance buildings to resuscitate that credit and therefore it was passed um, with um, by adding in the high performance requirement uh, with exactly the same economic terms as the credit that had uh, that was no longer available to the city so effectively to the consumer if you will the economic benefit is the same uh, it does have the high performance requirement just as the high performance requirement applies to the market rate rental uh, to your question about what is the added meaning of high performance, uh, the answer is I do not believe, and I'm, I, I think this is correct, that it does not mean anything beyond um, the city's code, which has over the many over the years become much more focused on certain high performance measures. So I think that that meeting the city building code as it exists today, having been modernized over the last decade or 15 years or whatever it's been, as green building laws and other things have become more prevalent. I think that you do not need to meet a higher standard in order to qualify for the high performance aspect of either of the two credits that are labeled high performance. Um, I would say that you know all of these questions just point out the need for the task force to sit down and think through um, the way I always say is what are we trying to incentivize? Um, do the tools we have on the ground now incentivize those things? And if not, what changes need to be made either to remove uh, incentives or credits that are not consistent with city's policy and ambition and where we are today, and also to add credits or other incentives that might be helpful to incentivize things that we do want to. And we just have not had that evaluation in a long time. What you have now is a lot of kind of stapled on, bolted on credits that have that have been invented over the years. And clearly, the time has come for a comprehensive review, which is why this task force is so important. And it will allow us to evaluate things like, what do we mean by high performance? Should there be a higher level? Do we need a higher level? What does it mean? And on the, on the uh, historic piece, I'll just mention, I know that's the other bill, but there are a lot of questions there that came up in a task force that a number of us served on uh, when the focus was merely, not merely, but only on that bill about what do we, you know, what is a historic credit? Because I, I would just say that that there's a lot of there's a lot of um, 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 justification for the idea that we may need we need a historic credit perhaps but we also need a fundamentally a rehab credit ways to incentivize the rehabilitation of the many 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 um, row houses and other structures across the city and really that doesn't exist today um, so uh, there's so many questions and this hearing has really just once again pointed out the need to do exactly what we're doing so we would just say in conclusion. Uh, please uh, encourage you to support uh, the this extension, this temporary extension, and everybody's looking forward to this task force really digging into this with all the various perspectives, including some of the important questions that the committee has raised today. So uh, again, thanks. I, hopefully, I, I just try to take some notes to answer a few of the questions that came up, but if you have others and I can answer them, I'm happy to. Hey, Marguerite, real quick, um, uh, John, thank you for, for that clarification. I want to apologize because I, I think I may have mischaracterized the, the, the green piece, but I did dig up the piece, the, the portion of city of state code, uh, Title IX, Section 242, Councilman Dorsey, I've put that in the um, chat window. Uh, but that basically lays out uh, the options uh, for, um, you know, what qualifies as, as high performance. Again, I would say our my understanding for conversations with Katie Byrne and others at DHCD, such as as Jason Hessler, folks who are uh, you know experts in in this area, uh, is that Baltimore City's uh, building code is is pretty progressive in terms of you know which way we lean in terms of green requirements. But anyway, the the detail is in the. Chat window for you, Councilman. Councilman Johnigan, I don't, I don't. 
think there was any mischaracterization in what you said. I, I was just amplifying that. Uh, oh. That the, you know. So in any event, but happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just pause here for a second, Councilman Dorsey. Do you have any questions on this one, or do you want to revisit? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marguerite, can you uh, jump to the next one? And thank you again, John. Ryan Potter. Yes. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, Ryan Potter, on behalf of uh, both Gallagher, Avelius, and Jones and the Baltimore Development Work Group. And uh, I will not be repetitive, uh, but do wish to echo Mr. Laria and others' comments in support of both this extension and also the broader effort to study this more fully. Thank you. Marguerite. Mr. Chairman, uh, she just unmuted me. This is Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin, Greenberg. Um, and also on behalf of the Baltimore Development Work Group, I, I again just want to reiterate our support for this, um, and and also just to to make the point that this pro this credit is critical to making new residential projects possible in Baltimore neighborhoods in um, areas as diverse as Uplands and Greektown would not be possible without this credit. And in fact, the second phase of the Uplands project will not be able to move forward without this extension. And so we appreciate the committee's support of this, um, this extension. We support the amendment to increase the extension from two years to five years um, due to the lengthy time horizons that are associated with these kinds of developments, as Mr. Bramble explained. Um, and we look forward to the study group's work on um, figuring out how the tax credits can best serve our city going forward. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, no more raised hands and that's um, Annie Milley, Miss Milley. Sorry if I mistakenly have my hand raised. I have uh, no further comments unless there are questions for me, which I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Cal um, Annie. Uh, colleagues, any other questions or discussion? Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd just like to make a statement. I, I just kind of think all of these tax credits are just giving away for um, you know, African American developers to have a seat at the table. Um, it's important that through this four or five year phase that uh, there's data collection. Um, it, it's all of this is just crucial to get acceptance so we can continue this even in after the next five years. Um, as I said before, uh, COVID has just really brought light to a number of um, inequities and inequalities. And I think all of this is just another phase to bring everyone uh, and give everyone a seat at the table, especially the ones that um, have been struggling to be a part of the development world. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Couldn't agree more. And and again, we're really going to, um, not just the task force, but this committee really going to need to rely on um, our agencies and city government, you know, first and foremost, Department of Finance, uh, as well as uh, DHCD, uh, CHAP, uh, BDC, our nonprofit partners like Live Baltimore, uh, to provide us, you know, research and, and data on this so that we're in a position to make the best decision possible in, in terms of moving the city forward. Councilman Stokes. Yeah, real quick. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see this word equity. You know that that name flies around all in the city and the neighborhood. The word equity. Oh, I don't know. Is this for Eric Crocom? Is historic preservation? Are they going to have a staff uh, to deal with equity? Because we can sit here and talk about equity, and we don't have the staff to really implement it. And it's, it's a nice, pretty buzzword. I heard it enough. So I don't know if the question is for Eric Oakham or whoever want to answer on this call to talk about equity. Is there going to be some staffing to, to address the equity when you're talking about this tax credit? 
somebody ask a question? Um, I, I'd, I'd like to take a shot at it. <laughs> before. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I know that, you know, they created the Office of Equity and added it to, um, I think, um, Dana Moore chairs that. And then it's going to take not just a, one agency individually, it takes all of the agencies partnering together. And we have we have other areas like the CAP centers that um, kind of work with a number of agencies and they handle things and are pushing that equity lens, but it's going to also take those partnerships. And then I guess an a agency can add to what I'm saying if they have an example of how they are um, addressing equity as our uh, as Councilman Stokes mentioned. Well, well real quick, um, Vice President, I, I understand it, but I'm talking about the staffing. Because in Olden Housing, they have uh, an equity officer, but that's it. There's no staff. So that's almost like having a work in an office, and you are the secretary, the director, all that. So my question is what kind of staffing is going to be? What kind of staffing is going to be part of this dealing with this equity itself? Because you can have one person, but a one person can't carry that heavy load. So I'm talking about the staffing piece, not just you know to say the word. You got one person. We never look at how we staff when we talk about equity. We just get one person and say that's the equity officer. But the equity officer needs some staffing too, so we can address when we talk about equity. So when those the data come back, the data is real thorough because one person can't be doing that all by itself. It's, it's a heavy lift. So that's just my question. So what kind of staffing is going to be there? For, for Councilman Stokes' question, um, why don't we, if it's all right, Councilman, I want to turn it over to Eric Tizo sure. from planning because that's, that's where a lot of this work is housed out of. Uh, yeah, good morning again. So, uh, obviously, we're trying to involve uh, equity analysis and um, everything that we do. Um, one of the earliest agencies to start working on that. I'll never say no to additional staff. Uh, so if you know anybody that's got some leverage there, happy to uh, to have that. But um, yeah, at the moment, uh, it's just internal resources that we can apply towards it. Okay. Stephanie, do you have anything to add on behalf of DHCD? Uh, sure. Um, Stephanie Murdoch with DHCD. Uh, we currently have uh, our communications director is assigned uh, the task of being our, off uh, our equity officer as well. So we did put in a request for our upcoming budget cycle to get a full-time uh, equity officer brought on as staff and um, certainly any help we can get to get additional positions around that I'm sure uh, we would appreciate. So you saying your communications director is the equity person? Yes, they're, they're serving multiple roles as our equity officer as well, but we are hiring on a full-time equity officer should our budget oh, request be supported. I hope that just don't be a good spin. That's what directors do, you know. We need staffing. And I hope housing can move forward on that so we can get that addressed. So thank you. You're welcome. Yes, we have requested that in our upcoming budget cycle. Thank you, Councilman. Colleagues, any other uh, questions, comments? Um, at this time, there's an amendment uh, that was a friendly amendment which was proposed. Uh, I circulated that at 9.48 a.m. Uh, via email uh, and that would change the uh, application uh, deadline from 2024 to 2027. Is there a, a uh, motion to move that amendment favorably? I move. Motion by Stokes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Middleton. Costello is a yes. Stokes? Yes. Middleton? Yes. Burnett? Yes. McCray? Yes. Uh, Dorsey? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. 
Amendment passes 7-0. Is there an amendment to move the bill favorably as amended? I'm, I'm, pardon me, pardon me, just pause. Is there a motion to move the bill favorably as amended? So moved. Uh, the motion by Stokes to move the bill favorably as amended. Is there a second? Second. Second by Middleton. Costello is a yes. Stokes? Yes. Middleton? Yes. McCray? Yes. Burnett? Yes. Schleifer? Yes. Dorsey? Mr. Chair, I think I don't want to be repetitive. I think I made my point in referencing the finance department's report from Bill 190414. Um, I think that that says what I need to say. Um, so I'm going to again vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this bill passes 6 1 and moves to second reader at the next full meeting of the city council. Uh, we are now going to take a brief recess. Uh, we will reconvene in seven minutes at 11.30 a.m. Uh, for our quarterly oversight hearing of BBMR and Baltimore City uh, Public oh, excuse Schools. Me. Uh, yes. Chair. Yes. I think Amy wanted to ask something before you recessed. Amy, are you still in? Amy? Yes, mm -hmm. um, I'm here. So I don't know if you can... If this so for 21-0167, I saw recently that um, finance had proposed an amendment, and I didn't see that until after we had actually discussed 21-0167. I was wondering, was this finance amendment um, discussed at this meeting? I I just I didn't catch that if it was, um, and I need to know that for writing um, the committee amendment, obviously. It, it was not. Um, Nina, do you want to add any clarification on that? Yes, uh, the Department of Finance determined that it wasn't going to move forward with introducing the amendment. Okay, all right. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, we're now in recess. We'll be back in seven minutes at 1131 a.m. Thank you.